It's 7.30 now. Hello again, guys and girls. Biology is most likely one of the underrated topics on this year's camp. So I'm very glad to, ha to have a speaker here who will give more insight into that. Gene Hacking, please give a warm applause to Mark Jewell. Thank you. So I'm going to talk to you about hacking DNA. Um, most of you are probably familiar with uh, programming uh, or electronics, but uh, we're beginning to hack DNA or hack biology. And I'm going to give you a bit of an overview on the, the technologies involved. So first of all, why would we want to hack biology? Uh, well, biology is a very different system from the ones we use, we usually work with, but it has some nice properties such as self-replication. Biology has a nice property that if we program one cell, it will self-replicate. We can build microscale devices. This is a virus that attacks bacteria, bacteriophage. It's 200 nanometers or a little bit less. And this is one of the component parts that goes inside of a cell, 2.4 nanometers. So you could say this is a kind of nanotechnology, though the devices themselves are microscale, um, the components are often nanoscale. And we can use it to build macroscale devices. We see this in nature. We're not quite there yet with the technology, but uh, we know the capability is there. Biology, you can use the environment itself as the building material. This tree, 90% of its dry mass is, CO2, is from CO2, carbon and oxygen from CO2. So you can build quite large devices from just the gases surrounding you. We can produce some interesting chemicals, or nature can produce some interesting chemicals. This is a wormwood, type of wormwood, and this plant contains azomycinin, which is an antimalarial drug. DNA has the nice property that it has a standardized language. This is something we don't have in computer science. Uh, we have a genetic code composed of four letters, and we have 20 different amino acids that these four letters can specify. And this is true for all biology. Biology gives us the power to hack ourselves. So if we master biology, we'll be able to master the technology they built us. And just to get a bit of a space angle on all of this, if we can hack ourselves, then maybe we can solve some of these uh, problems that NASA has identified uh, that comes with space travel. So we have uh, cardiovascular deconditioning, decreased immune function, bone loss, some bad stuff that we probably have to deal with if we want to stay in space for a long time. Okay, what's the state of the art of biohacking or um, synthetic biology? Synthetic biology is the technology of engineering biology. Well, we can produce chemicals in, uh, in different organisms than the ones that they are normally produced in. This is an article about the production of the uh, atomicinic acid, which is a precursor for the atomicinin I showed earlier. And these guys out of uh, UC Berkeley, they managed to produce this drug in uh, normal beer yeast or baker's yeast. And by doing this, they're able to produce it much more efficiently and for a much smaller cost. So malaria is a huge problem. It causes 20% of childhood deaths in Africa. That's about 2,000 deaths per day. And these guys produced artemisinin in, in yeast, which is lowering the price, and it's also going to solve some problems such as availability. Sometimes you have a low crop yield or you have a market fluctuations and that can yield, that can lead to uh, problems with availability. And this drug was created in, in 2006 and the proof of concept, not the drug, the proof of concept about producing a drug in yeast and it'll hit the market in 2012. So it still takes us a while to do these kinds of things but they are possible. This is a student project 
that I think is pretty cool. It's called E. coli. And they took an E. coli bacteria and they modified it to produce all these different coloring colors. And this is very useful because if we can produce different colors in a bacteria, then you can hook those color producing elements up to, let's say, sensors or something you're interested in. And then you can get an output that's very easy to read out. So instead of having to go in and do very difficult analysis in a lab and have, have very difficult to use an expensive equipment, if you can have the bacteria produce the color directly based on the inputs that it detects at a micro scale, then you could imagine all these nice uses, diagnostic uses, and they, this is what they imagined. <laughs> so this is uh, an imagined application of B-chromi whereby it would live in your gut and it would have detectors for all the things that make you sick in different ways. And based on, on this, it would produce different colors so you could very easily see if something's wrong with you and not just something, but have an idea what it is. This is another student project. This is uh, an E. coli that was modified to detect nitrogen in soil. And nitrogen in soil is, of course, very important for production of uh, food crops. And if you know something about how much nitrogen is in your soil, then uh, you know how much fertilizer you need to use and maybe something about what kind of crops you should grow this year. And they make these little gel beads with these E. coli bacteria that you just spread over a field and they'll light up based on the amount of, uh, of nitrogen. And then you can go out at night and you can have a look and see how much it's lighting up when you, when you put a black light on it. You can make cancer-killing bacteria. This is a project out of, by Anderson out of uh, UC Berkeley. And uh, these bacteria were modified to detect when they're near cancer and detect when there are enough of them near cancer. And then actually invade the cancer and start killing it. And the idea is you would put this into your bloodstream, these bacteria that have been modified to help you instead of kill you, and they would find the cancer, and once enough of them find the cancer, they just destroy themselves and the cancer with them. Um, not quite at a stage where you can use it yet. Uh, one of the problems with this technology is that our immune system is really good, so it has a tendency to kill off bacteria that's floating around in the bloodstream. People are starting to produce some interesting polymers, like uh, spider silk, which is a really strong material we'd like to mass produce. The problem is that spiders, they don't like each other very much. They uh, tend to destroy each other if you try to farm them in a big area. And it's very difficult to farm spiders if you have to keep them separate with their own little area and harvest the silk. So if you can produce spider silk in the E. coli bacteria, then you just have a big vat of E. coli growing, and then you can go them for a while, break them down, and then extract the spider silk. Some people have worked on this project. It's uh, still not quite up to the spec of normal spider silk, but it's getting there. And uh, all these projects were done with two organisms, the, the two best characterized, most well understood organisms in biology, E. coli and normal beer yeast. So we're at a very early stage right now where we only have the capability of engineering some, uh, some of these very well understood organisms, or at least it's difficult to use uh, the, the more interesting organisms with the multicellular organisms. But um, these two we know pretty well, and we can do a lot of stuff with them right now. Okay, so we've established all the cool stuff you can do with DNA. But how do you actually do it? How do you hack DNA? Well, when I look at something I want to hack, I usually see if there's any documentation. It's a nice first step. Then I want to figure out how do I compile it, if it's some kind of code. And how do I run the code? If you know this, then you can hack any system, right? So the problem is that we didn't really get a lot of documentation from nature. Evolution is not big on code comments. But we have some nice textbooks where all of the science we have to the date to this date can be looked up very easily. And you can go and find some review articles that show you uh, how a lot of stuff in biology works. Of course, you can go to this nice site called PubMed, and you can find articles about almost anything in biology. Um, 
even though we have a lot of articles and a lot of information that we've built up, and we've built all this up by reverse, in, reverse engineering biology, um, we're still at a stage where we don't know a lot. E. coli, the, the most well understood organism, we only know about three quarters of the components, what they do, uh, and about only two-thirds of the, of the components have been uh, characterized and experimentally verified to be sure what they do. And uh, of course, even though you might know all the components and what all the components do, you still have to figure out what do they do when they're working together. And this is very difficult to simulate. It's a very stochastic uh, environment, a lot of stuff interacting in different ways that it wouldn't if it had been a, a designed system, but this is an evolved system, and so it's fairly difficult for humans to understand. Okay, before getting into how to write the code, I'm going to talk about some of these technologies that are the basis of uh, biohacking. There's sequencing, synthesis, assembly, and PCR. And sequencing is the act of taking some DNA or an organism and getting its DNA and then reading it into a computer so you can look at it. Synthesis is the opposite. It's like DNA printing. So you have some DNA information on your computer and you want to turn it into an actual DNA strand, you use a DNA synthesis device. Then, uh, because synthesis is very expensive right now, it's getting cheaper all the time, but it's still pretty expensive, you, you might have some DNA lying around for different components. So you need DNA assembly to stitch together pieces of DNA into bigger systems. And you need PCR for grabbing a piece of DNA out of a bigger piece and amplifying it. So if you have a little bit of DNA, you can use PCR to amplify it and get a lot of DNA, but you can also use it to pick out a specific piece of interest and then amplify only that piece. I'm just gonna give a quick overview of over this, the central dogma of biology. And this is, uh, once we understood this, we basically understood the principle of how all biology works, so it's pretty important. You have some cells, this is E. coli, magnified 15,000 times, scale of uh, two micrometers, this line is two micrometers. And inside of these cells, there's some DNA. This is a green fluorescent protein, it's a nice protein that lights up green when you put a black light on it, and this is the DNA code for it. 70, 720 base pairs, or nucleotides. Um, what happens with its DNA inside the cell is that it's transcribed, is the word, it's turned into RNA when it needs to be used by the cell. So you have this double-stranded DNA that we've all seen before, and it's turned into single-stranded RNA. And this is kind of the working copy that the cell uses, whereas the DNA is the archive copy that it keeps around when it's multiplying. The RNA is then turned into this string of amino acids which is also known as a protein. So for each of these three letters, uh, for each three letters in DNA, they're read out as one block, and that one block codes for um, one um, amino acid, which are the base components of proteins. So you go from DNA, from a string of DNA to a string of amino acids, where you get a third the amount of amino acids of the, the DNA, and these little three three nucleoside blocks are called codons. So if we have, have to look at this from a computer science perspective, you have nucleotides that are four, four different kinds of nucleotides, so that's two bits of information right here. And then for a codon, you have three of these, so that's six bits for one amino acid. Oh, and I have a nice slide here that shows that. Um, so you go DNA, RNA, amino acid strand, and just as the bases in DNA have um, nice letters, the amino acids also have letters, so you can have an amino acid code like this. And then once you have an amino acid strand, what happens is that it folds into a structure. And this is actually one strand of amino acids that's folded into the structure of the green fluorescent protein. And it's the structure that gives it function, the structure and the different amino acids and the different positions. So yeah, proteins have function. That's why they're useful. So what I just showed you tells you how all the components in, or most of the components in uh, living organisms are made. 
You have DNA that are tur that's turned into proteins. There's also some other stuff. There's uh, metabolites, stuff modified by the proteins. But the actual machinery, most of it is proteins. And these proteins, they have different kinds of function. There's the green fluorescent protein we've already seen. There is something like insulin. And green fluorescent protein is very simple. It just, uh, just lights up. Insulin um, actually goes outside of the cell and to other cells, and it can signal other cells in different parts of the human body. So you have some proteins that function to signal. You have signal receptors. So inside of cells, if you can uh, imagine this, uh, we're looking at the edge of the cell wall, and this is inside the cell down here, and up there it's outside the cell. There are some proteins that actually sit at the cell wall, and they detect signals, and they change conformation inside, and they can send the signal to other proteins inside of the cell. There's enzymes that can modify um, chemicals in different ways. Okay, we say they catalyze chemical reactions, so we have enzymes that can, um, that can change the reaction rate of the reaction that would normally take place at statistically insignificant rates. So these enzymes can make sure that uh, different chemical modifications happen at very fast rates inside of, protein, inside of cells, and that's why cells can produce a lot of interesting metabolites. So E. coli has approximately 4,500 uh, proteins or uh, parts. And as I said before, we don't know the function of all of them, but we know a lot of them. So now that we know that we can have these functional units based on DNA, how do we write DNA to change the function? Well, one way would be to write new components write the DNA for completely new proteins. We're not very good at that yet. We, there is some initial research where they've created completely novel proteins, but what's happening mostly right now is that we discover proteins in nature, and then we find the DNA sequence for them, and then we can use those proteins in new combinations. So we use libraries of pre-built components uh, to build new systems. And this is an example of a library of uh, biological parts. This is the register of sta registry of standard biological parts. Uh, it's a completely open site where you can go and you can find parts for all different kinds of functions that you're interested in. And uh, you can get the DNA sequence. You can order the, the DNA as an actual physical piece of DNA and get it in the mail. And you can combine them in different ways. So the problem with these devices is that they don't have this. They don't have a, a data sheet like we see in electronics, because if you have a part, you're really interested in knowing exactly how it works under different circumstances and knowing when it breaks down, what the linear range is, what kind of input and output it has. And a lot of the components in the parts registry, there are a lot of components there, but a lot of them, they, they're not very well characterized. And there hasn't been a really good standard for characterizing these uh, Parts. So it can be difficult to use. It's kind of like going into a, a, a library of open source projects, and some of them will be very undocumented, and some of them won't be, but most of them here are pretty, pretty undocumented. Most of them contributed by students working on a deadline. So this is an example of what an electronic data sheet could look like for biology, or an equivalent. Uh, and this is what we would like to see for all of the parts in biology. So there's an organization called Biofab in uh, California right now that's trying to create this kind of library of professionally characterized parts. And you can go online to the website, and you can find different parts in their library. And you can find a part that has the exact function you want. You can look at the data. So this is the we're beginning to get well-characterized parts. OK. Once you have these characterized parts, how do we write programs? Well, in computer science, we do this for a Hello World program. In biology, it's a little more, bit more difficult. You need a few more parts to do a Hello World. I'm not going to go into the details of these parts, but basically, you need something to kickstart the, the transcription from DNA to RNA. And then you need another part to go to take it from RNA into, uh, into the uh, sorry, the protein, 
And then uh, you, had, you also need a terminator to show where the RNA should end. So you, this is the gene, this is the part. You also need some other, other control sequences around it. And these control sequences, they spe specify how much of the part is made, and they can also specify when the part is made. So this is just a basic hello world that always outputs a green fluorescent protein, but you can imagine more complex circuits that only produce it when something happens, such as the nitro nitrogen detection system I showed earlier that detects an outside signal and then it produces GFP in response. Okay, well, how do we compile and run the code? Well, there's no real equivalent to compiling in DNA because we're still working with the base code. We're still working at the machine level, machine language, uh, sorry, machine code level. Um, we don't really have abstract programming languages yet. So we have to use, take these parts and combine them, and that's called assembling the parts. And you can get the parts in different ways. You can synthesize a part, you can pay a company, and go online, put your credit card info, put the DNA, they'll send you back the DNA. And uh, then you can assemble them. You need some chemistry. You can buy kits for this, assembling different parts into a single strand. Then you need some way of putting it, putting it into a live cell. And usually what you do, or a simple way of doing this, is to use a circular piece of DNA called a plasmid. So you take the DNA you assembled, you put it onto the circular piece of DNA. And the circular piece of DNA has all the stuff you need to express the DNA inside a cell. Then you put the plasmid into a living cell, and then when you grow the cell, all the DNA and the chromosomes of the organism will be expressed, but also the circular little piece of DNA that you put in there. So you have this little, not an extra chromosome, but a little extra piece of DNA that gets replicated with the whole system. And you put this plasmid into living cells by, yeah, you could do it in different ways, but it's surprisingly easy. You can use something called a gene gun for plants. It has these little gold particles that are charged and the DNA attaches and you can shoot it in. And some of them will end up in cells and they'll replicate and so on. You can also just uh, use some chemistry to stress the cells out. If you have some E. coli, you can put them in some chemicals where they get kind of not broken up, but they get kind of stressed out and then they start taking up DNA. You can also give them a shock and that does the same thing. So it's pretty easy to get your DNA into the cells once you have it on a plasmid. And of course, growing cells depends on what kind of cells you have. For E. coli, you can grow them in, you basically just need some sugar and some base nutrients to grow them on. Okay, so one of the challenges that we have, apart from the characterization problem, is the lack of modularity of parts. We, uh, the biological systems are not designed systems, and that means that there's no nice modularity where parts don't interact in ways you don't want them to. All the parts interact, and not all the parts, but a lot of parts interact in many different ways that are very difficult to characterize. And all this is kind of floating around in this big soup of parts. And so it's very difficult to stop things from, from um, uh, interacting in ways that you don't want. Um, there is there's a lot of effort going on right now to try to make more modular parts. But it's yet to be shown if we can really have complete modularity in biology. But if we could get this modularity of parts, of course, it would be very easy to simulate and it would be very easy to design new systems because then you know hey, this part has this input and this output and this other part has another input and output and you hook them up and you get this result. Right now, often when you try that, you have to take into account all the other stuff that's also floating around in the cell and all these interactions that you probably didn't think of. So it's still, it's fairly hard to, to do biology, uh, to do synthetic biology. But we still, we have some pretty interesting systems built. In the E. coli, someone implemented a genetic toggle switch. So that's kind of like a flip-flop circuit. And people have implemented these logic gates in cells as well and ways of communicating between cells, between logic systems in different cells. So we do have it's the beginnings of something you'd call abstractions on top of biology. We, we have the things we've used in electronics to build abstractions at least. So maybe we can build more abstractions. So what we'd like to have, or what I'd like to have, is a, a more abstract language, a biological programming language where I don't have to take parts and put them together and simulate and try it in biology and tweak it if it doesn't work. I'd like to have uh, 
um, an abstract language where I can just write some code and click compile, and it'll find the parts, put them together, and then give me the result I need. There are some efforts going on right now um, out of BBN laboratories, specifically in uh, at the east coast of USA. But um, the, it's very early work, and even though we have some initial uh, implementations of this, it uh, doesn't really compile down to a working biology yet. Hopefully it will soon. Okay, well, now I'm going to talk a little bit about biohacking in the, the do-yourself bio community. All of the stuff we saw before, a lot of it was by students, but it was all done in um, institutions, in universities or research institutions. So I'm gonna show you some of the stuff you can do if you don't have a lot of money and if you're just working out of your garage. There's a whole community right now, and you can go to doyourselfbio.org, and you can see all the different places in the world where people are working on, or people have spaces where you can go and work on biology. Some of these are just groups that meet up every once in a while. Some of them actually have physical labs where you can go and you can have workshops and learn how to hack biology. And some of them are pretty advanced. This is GenSpace in uh, New York. And GenSpace actually have their own standalone lab where they do workshops, where they have some interesting projects going on. They're actually doing synthetic biology. They're actually modifying circuits, and this is their own little uh, PCR machine, uh, the DNA amplification device I talked about. So they actually built one themselves. And basically, what it works by heating up and cooling down some different uh, enzymes and some DNA and some building block materials. So that's a really useful device to be able to build. And this is another interesting project. They're building this uh, sampling, this uh, balloon sampling station that you send up into the atmosphere, and then it will sample some of the biology that's floating around up there. And mostly, they're doing this because, well, who knows what's up there? No one really knows what's floating around up in the near the stratosphere. If there's any life up there, it would be interesting to find out. So they're gonna grab this, um, use the sampling station, and grab some of that if it's there, take it down, have a look at what kind of biology they, they get, and they could do that in multiple ways. They could try to grow it, but maybe it won't grow because it's up there where there's no oxygen. They could also try to sequence the DNA if they can get some, some people with a sequencing machine to help them out. This is the Boss Lab in Boston, and they have a little space in another, in a hackerspace called Sprout. And they're really cool because they have this extreme transparency, transparency, you can go on their website and you can look at all their lab notes, so everything that they do is logged. You can see everything they do even if it fails, even if they do something stupid like spill a chemical they probably shouldn't have spilled, it's, it's there on their website. Um, and this is a really important thing to have because I'm gonna get into this later, but there's, a, there's some people who are a little bit worried about these uh, garage biologists just working on synthetic systems in their, in their little garage spaces. Uh, so it's important to be very transparent and open about what we do. This is the, my own little space that I co-founded with some people at the Copenhagen, Labor uh, the Copenhagen Hackerspace called Labitat. And a couple of projects here is uh, one guy did a colony count application for Android. So when you grow uh, bacteria, one, a lot of the time you grow them on these plates and you want to figure out how much grew because that's a measure of how, how much your bacteria are thriving. If they're not growing very well, you only see a lot of colonies. So this is a, an application where you take a photo and it assists you in counting the, the colonies really quickly and then doing some calculations to figure out the concentration and how well they're living. We also have this uh, safer dremelfuge. So I'll get to the dremelfuge later, but basically it's a home-built centrifuge that was improved to not kill you. <laughs> um, there's a little bio group at Noisebridge, and we made this little thing called the BioBoard. It's a prototype right now. We're working to, to make it better. And the BioBoard is interesting. I mean, it's not really synthetic biology like I talked about so far, but this is kind of a different angle on biology. Of course, you don't have to genetically modify biology to do biohacking or to do do-it-yourself biology. A lot of people, they just uh, want to analyze biology and figure out maybe how to make some better beer or some brew some nicer kombucha something like that. So in the, at Noisebridge, we're trying to 
quantify the brewing process of kombucha, and we made this bio board with a little optical density sensor that gives you some kind of indication of, of uh, how many cells you have. And this is a pH probe we bought from an aquarium and built an amplifier for it, so you can do a little pH measurement. And this is the prototype of an optode to figure out how much oxygen, dissolved oxygen you have in the kombucha. Of course, you can use it for all kinds of different things, but we're hoping to make a big um, set of components, set of uh, measuring devices, so you can quantify any kind of bioreactor, whether you're brewing beer, kombucha, or making a cure for malaria. LA Biohackers has a really cool project. So there, there's this problem when you have a grow a lot of, you know, when you have a lot of crops you want to grow, you need a lot of ammonia to feed the, the crops. You need a lot of fertilizer, and that costs a lot of money. About one to two percent of energy in the world is spent on, uh, is spent on on this nitrogen uh, or ammonia production. And if we can figure out a better way of doing this, then we can, you know, save one to two percent of the world's energy. Maybe some plants they're really nice because they can, they can get ammonia from the atmosphere. They can take nitrogen and they can fix it to ammonia themselves inside of these little nodules in the roots. But only some plants do this, and there's a problem with the enzymes that that are responsible for this in that they don't like oxygen. So the plants that do this have this really intricate system where they prevent oxygen from getting in to where the nitrogen is, is made into, uh, is fixed to ammonia. And we'd like to put this enzyme, or LA Biohackers would like to put this enzyme into, uh, in, into every plant that we grow as a crop because then we don't need to use fertilizer or as much fertilizer. So they, they have this experiment going with uh, where they're trying to grow this weird strain that someone found that actually can do the nitrogen fixing with oxygen present. Problem is that it only works at 65 degrees. <laughs> so they're trying to see if they can change that and modify it to work at the temperatures the normal plants grow at. If they're, they're successful in this, then they'll be able to save us a lot of energy and a lot of fertilizer use. And uh, this picture here is their little incubator for this very exotic <laughs> organism that you needs uh, a lot of hydrogen, you need some hot carbon dioxide and a little bit of oxygen. There's a, a new facility being built right now, um, a, a biohacker space they're called BioCurious, and they just got their facility, so they haven't opened yet, but they're opening soon. 222 square meter facility in Mountain View. And, um, they got Kickstarter, Kickstarter funding, $30,000 of Kickstarter funding, so they actually have all the equipment ready. They're moving in, and hopefully they'll open soon. All of these uh, cool projects people are doing um, are not limited to just the do-yourself biospaces. There's collaboration between the different spaces. In GenSpace, there's a, a group that participates in this um, yearly competition of biology called iGem. And they're working from the space, from the hackerspace instead of from, or from the biohacker space instead of from the university, even though they're participating in a, a scientific contest. And LA Biohackers has set up initial collaboration with the place called BEI, which is the largest DNA sequencing facility located in Beijing in China. And these, it's very good to see that these. Uh, you know, institutions are open to collaborations with do-it-yourself biologists. This also shows that we're taking, taking very seriously, that uh, people are aware that you can actually contribute something that's useful just out of your garage or your little hacker space. So we still have some challenges with these uh, do-it-yourself or biohacking projects. There's a problem with getting the materials. We have some different materials you really need in order to do biology in the lab. You don't need materials for everything. A lot of biology can be done just using your computer, bioinformatics, analyzing data, building computer models. But if you want to actually modify DNA or grow biology, you need some equipment, some chemicals, some biology. That can be difficult to get. Some companies will, will send you the chemicals and biology if you're at a commercial address, and that's the only requirement, but it really depends on your country and where you live, what kind of zoning there is on the place where you live. So uh, depending on your country's local regulations, that might be very difficult or very easy. Equipment is really expensive, 
but a lot of the equipment you can build yourself. You can get kits. I'll show you some of them later on. Um, and uh, some of the equipment you can buy on eBay, of course. There's a lot of biotech companies that went belly up recently. So a lot of this is for sale on eBay. There's also some, uh, some challenges with the uh, laws and regulations, safety and ethics, copyright and patents, and I'll get into this now. Oh, let me just show you some of the equipment here. These are some of the, these are some of the projects, the uh, open hardware projects for uh, biotech. So this is the open PCR project. It's a completely open kit for uh, amplifying DNA, and you can get it for $512, buy the kit, assemble it, all the software is included, then you can start amplifying DNA. You can buy some of the, the primers online, there's these little pieces of DNA you need to only amplify a certain part of DNA. So you can start doing some pretty cool biology just having this device. And then if you combine it with this device, this is an electrophoresis box that lets you separate different pieces, of DNA of different sizes or proteins of different sizes by dragging it through this gel with the so you apply some power, it drags the DNA put in it across a gel, and then it separates by size and by charge of DNA or proteins. Very simple device. There's a, an open kit you can buy as well. And this is the Dremel view I just showed you earlier. Basically, it's a 3D printed head for a Dremel, and you can put your little <laughs> containers in it, and you can spin it up to about 30,000 RPMs. You probably shouldn't, but you could. <laughs> <laughs> And that also can separate out proteins of different sizes in a very simple manner. So we have a lot of computer self equipment being built and combined with stuff you can get on eBay. Uh, you can actually set up a lab in your own home pretty easily. But what about the laws? <clears throat> there is uh, the two different regimes I've, I've looked at, the European Union and the US, and they're very different. In the European Union, we have all these European Union level directives that all the countries uh, have to implement. So there's some directives that are kind of general rules about what we can do, and then there's the local implementations of those rules that differ from country to country. So there's a certain minimum, and then they can make it more strict. And even though the local country implementations vary, it basically says that the, the European Union level directives basically say that you can't do genetically modified organisms, at least not the one, the, in the methods that we usually use or using the methods we usually use without getting a certification, without getting licensed to do it. Um, and that's true for all European Union countries, so that makes it really difficult to do genetic modification in the European Union. There's a lot of other cool biotech you can do, but it makes it kind of difficult to get started, and it makes it really, really important to have these communal labs that get certified so that people can come there and use a certified lab and not be breaking the law when they do genetic modification. So right now there's only one duty cell bio lab that's been licensed in the European Union that I know of at least. Um, and that happened last month. That was uh, Cathal Gavi in Ireland who got his uh, own little lab certified and he's now holding workshops where you can go and without any genetic modification. In the United States, it's, it's different, they're very different. There's a lot of regulations, but they don't really apply for do-yourself biologists. And the reason they don't apply is that there are regulations for people who get funding from different sources. So if you're not getting funding from anything, and you're not you know, selling your product on the market or doing anything like that, and you're just kind of experimenting on your own, then you don't, there's no real laws about GMO in the US. You can just go and do it. But basically, you can, you can go and do biology. But that also means that, well, what if that, that makes it a little bit dangerous because there's a bigger chance that people might freak out that you're doing all this uh, dangerous stuff, this uh, genetic modification, without any sort of certification or anyone looking at what you're doing. Um, and the, the communities in the US are very aware of this problem. And what they've done is basically they've gone and talked to the FBI and uh, made sure that every time they do something, the FBI knows about it, and the FBI is very friendly, and, and uh, they, they'll have meetings with you if you want to talk to them about what kind of requirements they have and, and what kind of reporting they're expecting. But basically, um, no, no regulations, just make sure your local uh, law enforcement and the, the FBI know what you're doing, or at least the FBI. Um, there was a presidential commission for the study of bioethical issues that recently published a report 
And the conclusions for a previous cell biology was that it's no real danger yet. It's still too difficult to do anything really dangerous, uh, or at least build novel organisms that are really dangerous. And uh, the recommendation was that there should be active communication between law enforcement and the do yourself groups. And maybe there, in the future we can talk about constraints, but right now, um, fairly positive report. And then the FBI invited everyone to a workshop. <laughs> Uh, everyone uh, who was active in do yourself bio, I think, uh, got an invite with all expenses paid <laughs> to, uh, to Washington, D.C. to uh, meet with the FBI about uh, biosafety and do yourself bio. <laughs> and uh, I think most people, when they, uh, when they saw that, they didn't really know what to think. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, basically what they said was they just, uh, you know, they told us how to report if there's a problem, who to go to, what the, how the internal FBI structures are organized, and, and all this kind of stuff, and just to, to keep everyone in the loop so that there's not an incident of local law enforcement freaking out about something and then escalating so that the FBI knows everything that's going on and knows that you're not a bioterrorist with a secret lab. Okay. So there is a problem of both this, this uh, ethics and, and uh, public perception of biology. And that's something that, of course, everyone is doing, do yourself bio is very aware of. So there is two workshops uh, to form this kind of code for, uh, ethics code for do yourself bio. One workshop was in London, another in New York, uh, no, sorry, in San Francisco. And, uh, and these workshops, in these workshops, we tried to sit down and figure out a code of ethics that we can all agree on, figure out like, what kind of things do we, do we stand for, what kind of things do we not want to, to involve ourselves with, and uh, to kind of have this sign that we can hold up and show the media and show everyone that we're responsible and we've thought about safety and ethics. Um, and we're still working to compile this into a, a list that we can agree on. And this will become some kind of mini minimum list that a lot of these spaces, hopefully all of them, will adopt. Um, kind of like the Hippocratic Oath for doctors, but for do-yourself biologists, hopefully. And then um, I think we'll see a lot of variations on this code because it's uh, difficult to get a bunch of hackers to agree on anything completely. So uh, when, we, when we have this established code, we'll, uh, you'll probably see it pop up on all the do-yourself bio websites for the different groups in different, slightly different implementations. Okay, one last challenge. Copyrights and patents. So we all know how challenging this is in, in software, and uh, in biology, it's different, but no less challenging. Oh, uh, let me just talk a bit about copyright. So copyright basically doesn't apply to biology. That makes it really difficult, because we can't use any of the licensing schemes that we've seen. Uh, if we can't use GPL or a BSD license or anything like that. And the reason for this is that since we're not, the inter interpretation right now seems to be that we're not building proteins from scratch, we're finding them out in nature and reusing them and modifying them. So what we do isn't seen as um, a creative work and that's why copyright doesn't apply. And that seems to hold true for not just the, the US and European Union but international copyright law in general. So basically we have to get to a point where we can we can create something from scratch and have it be a creative work before we can use these nice open source public, uh, open source licensing schemes. Now, patents is really the intellectual property that's used for the genes. There's a lot of patents on genes and genetic systems, and that's what you have to deal with in biology. So there's been an attempt by uh, Drew Endy uh, out of uh, Stanford to make this biopic public agreement, and it's it's an attempt to do something like um, an open source license or a free software license, but for biology, given that we don't have copyright. And it's kind of weird when you're used to these normal software licenses in that you have two agreements and not only does the person who makes the uh, stuff available under this license have to sign, the person who uses it has to sign as well. So you have this like document you actually have to sign and send in before you can start using this Biobrick public agreement. 
Uh, BioBrick, by the way, is a reference to the standard that's used uh, on a lot of the parts that are freely available online. It's a standard that makes it really easy to take different parts and assemble them. And this license was made with, with these parts in mind. <clears throat> so, as you can see here, there's some stuff you agree to, and it's, it's the same kind of stuff that you see in open source licenses, but there's also this will not assert patents, and because there's no copyright, that's kind of the same as saying uh, you can freely use it. And there's also this nice disclosure of applicable patents. The thing is that it, of course, has to say you disclose the patents that you know about. Because what happens if you say, hey, there's no patents on this, feel free to use it, and someone comes along with a patent you didn't know about. So you can't ever really be completely sure that no one's gonna sue you, but hey, it's the same in software. So, um, yeah, contributor agreement, user agreement, it's very simple. Basically just says you've read and understood what the contributor signed, and you're not gonna use it for harmful things. That's a little bit different from open source. Um, and then, attribution, and you're not allowed to move, remove these biological tags because then you can't really trace it back to who made it. <clears throat> okay, so given all this, how do you get started with biotechnology, uh, hacking biotechnology? Well, it really depends what you wanna do. It's very easy, like I said before, to do dry lab only uh, stuff. In, in biology, we talk about dry lab versus wet lab. A wet lab is where you're actually using biology and chemicals. Dry lab's just on the computer. So. Dry lab only, very easy. Get a computer, start downloading stuff, and lots of sequence information available you can analyze, lots of resources online. Most programming languages have some kind of library um, for dealing with biological information. Then if you're doing non-GMO biology, let's say you're analyzing kombucha, or you're trying to figure out what kind of proteins are in something, and you're not actually modifying anything, also fairly easy. Uh, it might be difficult if you need some kind of specific organism you can't get from nature, you need it sent to you, you might still be subject to some different rules and regulations. But also, non-GMO biology, it's really only very difficult when you want to do really interesting stuff where you're building your own genetic circuits and implementing them, trying them out. Um, and uh, right now I can, I can only say that if, if you really want to do this, either move to the US <laughs> or get registered, get certified, figure out what the local process is for getting certified and start it because it's gonna take a while. But hopefully we'll see spaces, kind of like the hacker spaces, but biohacker spaces certified popping up around Europe in the next couple of years. Yeah, so really good resources for getting started. Uh, biology textbooks, you can get them cheap. They're, I mean, it might sound boring to start reading a textbook, but they're, they're not that difficult to read. They're not full of a lot of the difficult math or any really, really, difficult to understand uh, concepts. You can just kind of pick one up, start reading about how molecular biology works. Um, <laughs> open access articles. There's a lot of articles now that are open access, especially in synthetic biology. So most of the interesting articles right now, you can just go and download them for free. Of course, if you have university access, you get a lot more. Um, you can access all the nature articles and science articles. But there's more and more of uh, these uh, um, journals popping up, kind of like, there's one called uh, Public Library of Science One that has a lot of interesting articles that you could go and read. And of course, you can just start growing things that people have been doing this for many, many years, but maybe you could say, start growing things and then analyzing them instead of just blindly growing and hoping it works out. And we're hoping the BioBoard will help with this. And like I said, you can download data. You can download complete genomes that have been sequenced from many different organisms. You can download like yeast, human, E. coli, corn. Just go to the NCBI and they have a, a nice database and you can start analyzing it. See if you can find new proteins, identify a function of existing proteins, stuff like that. And uh, of course I urge you everyone to go to your local biohacking group and, and join up with the central mailing list and just start talking to the rest of the community if you are interested in, in uh, biology. That's it for me, so if anyone has any questions. Great talk, thank you very much. If there are any questions, please line up here at this microphone or hold your hand up so I will come to you. 
No questions? Are there any questions from the mighty, mighty internet? Ah, there's one. Um, what about development evolution? Devo Evo. There are, uh, is some work going on, but it's uh, quite quiet around this topic. Uh, when you look, since this guy um, told that in five years he will give everyone a dino chicken who wants to have one, and I'm still waiting for this dino chicken to happen. <laughs> um, what's about uh, this um, biohacking groups? Are you also interested in this kind of topic, this development evolution stuff? Uh, can you repeat what the, the box that you're talking about? What? This is, uh, you say this guy, he, uh, he had this, uh, he promised you, was, I, I didn't hear. Uh, it, it was some documentation in uh, Discovery Channel lately about, a, about this topic um, development evolution and it was about uh, back, uh, oh well I'm uh, not studying bio biology, I'm studying electrotechnics and this stuff but um, it was about um, the, the states in a, a food, if, what is it in English if uh, this thing in the egg develops to higher stages, so. and first these little things have tails. Also, uh, human have, has some fish stuff on him, which develop. Uh, well, <laughs> anyway, um, and if you stop the destruction of a tail, uh, di uh, even a chicken is a, keeps his tail like a dinosaur, yeah. and they manage to make a chicken with teeth and the tail yeah. and they're working on keep, uh, keeping this uh, chicken from losing its tail and its teeth and so on where, uh, before it hatches and uh, what's, uh, are you also interested in such stuff or are you only interested in bacteria? That's yeah, the so okay, um, so you're talking about the more macro stuff, yeah, so uh, most of the stuff I talked about here is microorganisms, and the reason I talked about microorganisms was uh, because they're very easy to genetically engineer, but uh, microorganisms are also being worked on mostly in, uh, in real science labs and not in backyard biology labs, um, because they're, they're fairly difficult, it takes a long time to do anything, so there are even more ethical issues involved when you're working with something with the brain and, and, and regulations around it. Uh, I'm sure people are very interested, but the barrier to entry to working with this kind of stuff is just uh, too difficult and we're, we're really just starting out in biological communities so, and there's so much you can do with the microbiological stuff that uh, I guess we're just picking the low-hanging fruit first. <laughs> we have one more question from the audience. Uh, hi there. I was wondering whether you have done any work to investigate or maybe model um, the robustness of genetic I'm modification. I'm having a lot of trouble hearing you. Can you? What? I, I can't Louder? Really, I can't really hear you. Okay. Um, I was wondering whether you've done any work towards okay. um, um, modeling or understanding the robustness of genetic modifications. Modeling or? Uh, robustness. Whether the uh, organism loses the function after a certain number of generations or under certain, under certain circumstances. Sorry. Robustness. robustness. Oh, okay. So you're talking about evolutionary robustness? Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I didn't really talk about evolutionary robustness, but that's also a big problem here because uh, once you engineer these, these circuits in certain biology, if they're producing some chemical that's not making it easier for them to live, then evolution will take its course and they'll kill off the ones that are producing it and ones that figure out how not to produce it will stay alive. So there's a lot you can do to try to prevent this kind of stuff from happening. And I don't think we're at the point in do yourself biology where anyone's really wor worried about this because mostly it's one shot of experiments in a lab. So it's mostly something you worry about if you run experiments for a long time at large scales. But as we build more complex circuits, it'll be, and run them for longer, it'll, it'll become a bigger problem. And we'll have to look at how to avoid this, this kind of stuff. So you can use specifically engineered organisms that, that tend to not uh, 
mutate as much and move around their DNA as much, so they have less of a chance of getting rid of the stuff you put into them. You can also try to give them an, an advantage, of course, but that's not, not always possible. Grow them on something that makes sure they, they die off if they stop doing what they're supposed to do. Um, there are different strategies, and, and a, lot of, a lot of work is going into this kind of stuff in industry because you really don't want your big industrial reactor with 1,000 or 10,000 liters of something valuable to stop producing or uh, because of a evolution. Oh. Uh, with the license, uh, it was that it was no harmful uses. Is that up for definition? Is, has there been any discussion about that? Or? No, no what uses? No harmful uses. No harmful uses. Yeah, no, there's no definition. <laughs> it just says no harmful uses. Okay. So, uh, yeah, uh, that's up for discussion. It's still a draft license. So oh. if you feel like discussing it, go ahead on the mailing list. I'm sure they, they'll be happy to have you. OK, thanks. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. You showed us Geoectrophoresis device. Yeah. Who did license you to use ethidium bromide or equivalent DNA dye? And how many companies are actually willing to sell it to you without you being a scientific institution? How many governments are willing to sell you this? Companies, I would rather companies, say. Companies, yeah. So Those ethidium bromide and the other DNA yeah. dyes are quite interesting chemicals yeah. with very interesting properties. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, the question is about uh, the electrophoresis device that can separate out DNA and proteins of different sizes. And uh, in this device, DNA use this thing called ethidium bromide, I think, ethyl bromide. And um, the, the, that's a coloring agent that attaches inside of DNA and makes it light up under a black light. It makes it really easy to see where the DNA is. Um, the problem is it's really dangerous. It's a cancerogenic. And you don't want to get it on your skin because it goes into your DNA and causes damage. So um, there are a lot of different alternatives. There's something called uh, CyberSafe that you can get that uh, is fairly easy to work with and not, not so problematic. You don't need to worry too much about getting cancer with that stuff. Um, I know you can get companies to ship that kind of stuff to you uh, in the US, but I'm not sure about the European Union. I haven't tried getting anyone to ship that to me. But there are definitely uh, alternatives that you can use that you can get a hold of, depending on your country. Uh, we are using Ethidium, which is quite, well, it works just fine. OK. That's, that's pretty much the question. You answered it already. Thank you. Um, isn't, wouldn't, you, wouldn't it be a very useful uh, general approach in modification of um, microbiological uh, organisms to just rely on modifying or extending uh, the plasmid instead of uh, manipulating the original uh, gene, uh, DNA? Uh, you're talking about using the existing proteins instead of uh, trying to build our own? Uh, the proteins are expressed uh, relying on the information of either the DNA or uh, the, the plasmid. And if you only modify the plasmid, which is a lot easier uh, to accomplish in the DNA, um, I think uh, wouldn't that accelerate the development of uh, useful uses of um, microbiological organisms? I'm still not sure you're, you're talking about the, the difference between using existing genes. Um, no, building building them from the ground up, also mm, not uh, using genes that are known, what what, what they express, but actually uh, just. Well, I wouldn't say randomly uh, assembling uh, nucleotide uh, pairs because it doesn't really make much sense. Oh, you're talking um, about uh, using uh, selection processes. And yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, I talk about rational design uh, of uh, microorganisms and genetic systems. So rational design of uh, putting genes together and then having some kind of expected function and then checking if you get it. Um, that's the way we build other systems, but in uh, in biology, of course, we can use a different process. We can use evolution to our, to our advantage. So you can put in some of the genes you're interested in, and you can have, make lots of different combinations. And then you can use selection to try to weed out the ones that didn't go so well. You can try to use mutation. So you can you just try to mutate to get what you need. If you just mutate with nothing else, and you want something really advanced, let's say you want a cancer-killing machine, it needs a lot of different parts. So it's very difficult to get that just randomly mutating. You probably have to wait. A, lot, a billion years or more, but uh, if you get, uh, if you have something that's very simple, that's like 
making an E. coli resistant to some kind of chemical, then you can definitely get that functionality just by mutating. There are some really powerful approaches. You should look up something called MAGE, uh, a multiplex automated genome evolution, where they combine evolution with rational design. So they, they take a lot of different components and they put them in in the order that they kind of think they should be, but then they make uh, combinations that have little variations and they, make some, they can make a lot of different combinations, uh, millions of different combinations at the same time using this very smart process, process and then they just select for the ones that work and they find that and then they start looking at how does the DNA look there? Can we go in and further rationally design? So you can get evolution to help you out. Okay, that's a nice idea, thank you. Hmm. We have one more question. Hi, uh, I was just wish, wishing to ask, uh, we saw many bio labs around uh, and some pictures of them. Uh, what about the environment? Is it possible to build something like starting in a normal, normal hackerspace cellar or there are some requirements and or the devices are quite, are enough isolated from the environment, this kind of? Oh, okay, yeah. So, um, so how, how much do you need, how much uh, equipment and uh, isolation do you need to grow this kind of stuff? Well, if you have a very dirty lab and uh, where a lot of people go there, um, you will have more problems with contamination. Uh, you definitely can do it in some place where it's not very clean, um, but generally you should just get a really good lab bench and you should put it in an area where you, there's not a lot of people moving about without lab coats on and just uh, very basic stuff really. Uh, you don't need a lot, the law doesn't require you to have a lot in, even in the European Union. Uh, you need some surfaces that are easy to clean and can be cleaned very well. And you need a door that locks, basically. And uh, if you want to do something really advanced, like all the stuff I've talked about here is biosafety level one stuff, and that's the certification that we're kind of aiming at to getting the first go. But if you want to do something that's a bit more dangerous or more advanced, sometimes you need biosafety level two, three, or four which is used for dealing with stuff that has the potential to harm humans. And, and of course, there are some legal requirements about the isolation, but um, it's not really extremely difficult to get the isolation for these kinds of bacteria. It was more on the practical side, uh, just to start and start with the basic stuff, which kind of contamination should be avoided and yeah, normal praxis, let's say. Well, yeah, wear gloves, uh, wear a lab coat, um, don't spit in your petri dishes. Uh, they're, they're, it's, really, it's really not especially difficult. You always get some contamination. And if you're getting a lot of contamination and nothing works, then maybe you should move to a different area or a clean area. But it's not, uh, the requirements are not that great. Thanks. <laughs> I'm going to try to um, add something to what you just said because in Germany and throughout most of Europe you um, have to set up a lab that fulfills the uh, legal requirements yeah. but you also need to have two people who have a degree in molecular biology or medicine or biology and three years of work experience in a Gentech lab okay. and the biosafety training so the bar is actually quite high for getting an S1 lab. Yeah. And you do have some leeway, but not much there. And also lots of companies will not actually ship stuff to you. Yeah, so uh, there's, a, yeah, there's, a very, uh, there's a lot of difference between the different countries. Uh, and I know also in Denmark it's, it can be very difficult to get the certification. You also need some people who have, have the correct training. And some countries need everyone to have the correct training. And, uh, and also, yeah, you, you do need uh, stuff like that in some countries. Um, most of it you can probably get used and you can still build a lab that uh, lives up to the requirements, but it, yeah, the buy is pretty high, I agree. The, the problem is that, uh, the thing is that the, most of the difficult requirements are the ones about um, training and the people who have to be responsible and write logbooks and the documentation you have to fill out and all the processes you have to go through, the actual sanitation and keeping every all the surfaces clean and keeping it locked away uh, seems to be, to me at least, uh, the most, the easiest part of the process. 
Okay, we do have one very last question on biohacking. Um, you mentioned that you had some kind of brainstorming process for the ethics for biohackers. Is there any specific outcome yet besides don't be evil? Well, yeah, there is a, a draft version. I'm, I'm sure you can, um, you can find it online on doyourselfbio.org on the mailing list. There's been a lot of discussion. Um, there was sent out a, a link to a document. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's published now, but I, I have to check. It might not be public yet. With, there was a, a discussion after the, the two workshops, and uh, I'm pretty sure they've published the results now. There's still preliminary results, and there's still discussion, but if you want to have a look and, uh, and go, uh, I don't have them, unfortunately, right here. Um, mostly with stuff like uh, respect your environment, or we'll, we'll respect our environment, and uh, yeah, they say uh, don't be evil, and we'll be responsible. Um, there's also some, some, some wording about transparency and openness. And mostly it's what you would expect of free software people working in biology. Thank you very much. Okay, that's it for this talk. Please uh, thank Mr. Mr. Biohacking. <laughs> we'll just call you Mr. Biohacking. <laughs> thank you very much. As As you leave this room, as you leave this room, please have a look under your seats, right and left at your seats. If you see anything that isn't supposed to be there, take it out with you. We have trash bags right there. Um, keep this place nice and cozy for the talks to come. <laughs>